Good morning. Good morning. Oh my goodness. Good morning. Do you guys hear that? Are you awake? If you weren't awake, you were officially awake. I'm Katie. I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, we're going to start a little bit different this morning, but we're going to call into a time of worship. We're going to have some music playing, which, do you have that Spotify ready? It's under the, there's a playlist. Anyways, we're going to do a worship song. The words will be on the screen um, to just get a call into worship, and then we'll come up and we'll get started together. But God knows your heart. He knows, and I, I, would, um, I would ask you to consider where is your heart facing today? What are you bent towards? And, um, and to really make this time about Jesus. And if you're like me, I have a very busy week ahead of me, and I have already started a very major to-do list, and I don't think that that's what God desires this morning. So all of that stuff, I promise you, will get done. All of it will be completed in time. But right now, let's just spend some time thinking and focusing on Jesus. Okay? So we're going to pray and then we're going to sing. And I'm going to ask you if you would, when it's time to stand and we'll worship together. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you are always in tune. You are always available. You are always present, God. We're so thankful, Father, that we can seek you and we will find you, your word says, if we seek you with all of our hearts. So right now, each one of us, we come to you and we take our heart and we, we direct it towards you. We set it before you and we worship you, God. And we're not caught up in to-do lists or plans, but we're just here and we're present. We thank you for the, the house of God. We thank you for every church that is gathering all over the world. We thank you for every praise that is going up to you, Father. And we thank you most importantly that we are who you say we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so go ahead and stand. The words are going to be up here. We're going to worship together.
Um, you may be seated. I um, I noticed because God has me in a different season right now, and He has me trying to figure this stuff out, and. I miss standing. There is something very powerful about that. All of a sudden, I was like, ooh, I miss that. Because normally, I get to be up here. So, anyways, we're so glad that you're here. We're going to do a couple of announcements, and then we're going to get to it. Um, a couple of things that we want you to be aware of. First of all, our website. Roger's always working, always bugging somebody to get information. God bless you, Roger. We love you so much. <laughs> so, ccmchurch.org for the latest and greatest. Um, you can also email us. Our best way to correspond right now is through our email, ccnazoffice at gmail.com. A couple of other things that I'm going to announce, and then Mary, I'll have you come up. And then Kara, are you going to make your women's announcement? Yes. <laughs> um, anyways, a couple of things that we want to make you aware of. We are going to be, obviously, celebrating Easter, which we are so excited about because you guys realize we didn't get to have Easter last year. That was when... COVID had just started and everything was like legitimately closed. So we get to make up for that. So we are like, we're going, we're going all in. Um, it's actually not going to be on campus. We're going to actually be at the park. So we want to invite you. It's going to be open air, but we want to invite you, your family, your friends. There's going to be Easter egg hunt. There's going to be breakfast. All, all that information will be starting um, on Facebook and also we'll have handouts and things for you this next week. So please mark your calendars. If you didn't know, Easter is on April 4th. So there's that. And the second thing that I want to announce really quick is I believe um, we are having a couples class on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. This is the third week this week, but it's each week is kind of its own topic. So if you are interested, please come. Uh, Sam and Day lead that, and it's in the fellowship hall on this side at 5 o'clock tonight. So we would love for you to come. So there's that. And then, Miss Mary, are you ready? Inviting yes. all of you to our prayer night. It's March the 26th, this Friday. No. No? Is it? Wait, what's this Friday? Oh, is it the 26th? 26th is a Friday. Yes, ma'am. Next Friday. Friday. Yes, next Friday. It's at 6 o'clock, and we'll be able to spend time in praying for your needs, for the needs of your family, for the needs of your own heart, for the needs of our, our city, our community our church. So please join us 6 o'clock this Friday. Thank you. Good morning, CCN family. Just wanted to let you know the women will be meeting next Saturday at 8 a.m. to have breakfast and discuss planning for the women's ministry. So we hope to see all of you there. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of announcements. No, I just told you to stay here because it's so really interesting. God just, it's not, I think it's the 26th. I'm pretty sure. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. So this morning, and I just remembered right now when you were standing here. So I, if you're like me, anybody have social media? You have some form of social media? And you know how people will sometimes will post on their things and then you'll be like, I'm praying for you or like, you know, we're here for you. And you know, like we say that, but it's almost like, it's like the cordial thing, but then most of us don't put any pedal to the metal. You know what I mean? Like if you need help, let me know. And then you're just like, I really don't plan on call, you know, <laughs> or I'm just kidding. But sometimes, right? Right? Because we're like, we're Christian, so we're supposed to help, right? But our human nature is like, I'll just say it and hope they don't cash in on it. But this morning, God told me that we are actually supposed to have a minute to um, to settle. That's probably not the right word, but we're going to go with it. To settle any anybody that we've said, like, I'll pray for you. Or, um, 
let you whatever. If you said that this week or you like put it on someone's post, like maybe someone passed away or something and you're like, I'll be praying for you. And then you didn't get around to it because you were busy or you're like me, you say that, but you also have four people with you. And so you can't just stop right then. I guess you could. Anyways, God told me this morning, he's like, will you please give the people of CCN a chance to settle those prayers this morning? I, I'm, I'm, it's really interesting. It's not something that happens that often to me, but I literally knew this morning I was supposed to do that, and then I got here, and I got scattered, and then I saw you, Mary, and I feel like you're the one who's to help us spend that minute and to settle. So everyone, if you have somebody on your heart, or if you told somebody that you would pray for them, um, we're going to spend a minute, we're going to do that, and Mary's just going to pray over that. Would you mind? Well, thank you, Katie, for listening to the Lord. That's, isn't that a beautiful thing that we can hear what he specifically wants us to do? So, so take a breath and bring into your mind those promises you made to other people and to God. And we'll just sit quietly while you... You bring those to the Lord. Dutch Sheets, I've been listening to him, and he says, our part matters. It really matters when we pray. God depends on us to pray for others. So spend this moment. Lord, we thank you that you are gentle with our weaknesses. Our intent is for you and for other people, but it can get crowded out. So thank you for being tender with our weaknesses and prompting us to remember that our prayers matter. They really matter. And we just thank you for letting us be a part of your plan in people's lives. And all the prayers that got lifted up, we know you hear, you, you hear, you wanted to have them uttered to you, even though they're not out loud. You hear, and now you hear, and you answer. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you. Amen. Amen. All right, praise to you, many. I'm telling you, God has us in a season of moving beyond what we know. I don't know how to explain that, but um, God God is everywhere. But sometimes he's like, I'm ready to get us out of your comfort zone. And he's like, I, it's time for you to get out of your comfort zone. And he's like, I'm everywhere, so how about you get out of it? So we're going to do something different. Did any of you ever go to church camp when you were younger? Anybody? You can raise your hand. Okay, we've got a couple. Did anybody go here? What's our, our Nazarene is Camp Pine Rock. Anybody go to the Arizona one? No, you guys were other places. Okay, so I was talking to Papa Steve, and I wanted to do something a little bit different. This is going to be your first test in stepping out of your comfort zone today. Okay, so look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Tell him, I can do it. <laughs> I can do hard things, even though this really isn't that hard. I can do things out of my comfort zone. It's important. It's important. All right, so there is an old song. It's based off of a song. Have you guys ever heard of I Will Call Upon the Lord? Yeah. Do you guys remember that? Okay. So Day and I, we practiced this this morning. So there's a thing in music called a round. And what a round is, is like, do you guys know the song Row, Row, Row Your Boat? One person starts, and then at a certain point, another person starts, and you keep going. We're going to do something similar to that, and you're going to enjoy it, please. <laughs> so what's going to happen is, um, since I'm over here, you guys are going to follow me, okay? And then everyone on this side of the church, you're going to follow Miss Day over there, okay? So we're going to teach you the melody of this song, and then we're going to just try it, and we'll see how it goes. Does that sound good? Okay. I'm so nervous. 
Okay. All right. So the, the psalm says this. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the name of the Lord. Or I'll call upon the Lord. Okay. I just want to get the right key. Okay. So here's how the melody goes. You can sing it with me. I will call upon the Lord. We're called to worship together. Ready? Okay. I will call upon the Give. 
And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Do whatever you want to 
It's a slight disappointment from the side of the room over here. My son somehow thought it would be more important to stay up till 2 in the morning playing PlayStation than get a good night's sleep for his dad's sermon this morning. I don't know. Kids, right? What do you do with them? <sighs> Other than love them. You know, the song we were just singing this morning fits into the, the message, obviously, but I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. And this week's message is contemplation. And I think all of us can understand that in the busyness of today's life, we often neglect the time that it takes to actually connect with God and to draw near to Him in a way that is truly surrendering, where we think of and contemplate the things that we're supposed to be doing, the things that God is saying to us. And I'd like to open this morning, uh, this morning's message with a quick prayer if you could join me here. God, there are many times in my life that I feel distant from you. Help me to carve out the necessary time in my life to develop a deep and abiding relationship with you. Give me a focused desire to know you and to make you known to others around me. Please help me add regular time in prayer to do and in what I do every day. So it's week three, we're doing the contemplation. Do we have the video? Do you want to play the, the cute little video that he does? Because we're no longer slaves. The first week. But the truth is, even, even if, 
even if the habits, even if the things that we're doing are not that focused, we're all doing it. Whatever your daily life is, it's a distraction from what it is supposed to be. Um, so where is the time in our lives for the command in Roman 12 too? Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When I heard that, most often I think to myself, okay, so don't be conformed to the sin of the world and those kinds of things. But it doesn't clarify that. And it's wrong of me, it's wrong of us to make assumptions that are not clarified in the Bible. And I read this and it says, do not conform to the pattern of the world. More specifically, the TPT says, stop imitating the ideas and opinions of the culture around you. The ideals and the opinions of the culture around me say that I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. I'm supposed to spend time doing this. I'm supposed to spend time doing these things and those things to the point that even this morning, Katie said, when I'm with four or five people and I can't, yes, you can. Right. And we should. And she even clarified with herself as, as soon as it came out of her mouth. Mm -hmm. Why don't we? Mm -hmm. But be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. <coughs> This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. Not yours, not your spouse's, not your neighbor's, not your boss's, His eyes. The ideals and opinions of the culture of the world around you, I don't think that many of us really realize how conditioned we've become of this. How much of the part of the world we have become, even as we attempt to stand out and be different as Christians. I don't know how many times a day I hear people and myself say, I had to send that happy birthday to someone. So, you know, you're talking to someone and you see them on their phone. And like, what are you doing? Oh, I had to send that happy birthday. I had to reply to this. I had to reply to that. Oh my God, did you see this? I had to comment on this. We do this out of a cult cultural obligation that we've been drawn into, that we don't even really understand. We don't want to upset anyone. We don't want to lose an opportunity. We don't want to lose a friend. We don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And so we put off those things that are in front of us. For those things that are important to us, we keep at a distance because of the electronic relationships that we want to keep happy and keep satisfied. And it makes me wonder, why are we not equally concerned with pleasing God? Why are we not worried about upsetting God? I'm worried about upsetting that person who I saw three years ago who's on my Facebook that I have to send a happy birthday to. Why am I not worried about upsetting God by not having a good intact and keeping that relationship with Him? Why does that always come last? It's almost like that, that for grantedness that you get in a, in a marriage, sorry, but after a long period of time where, well, she knows I love her, but I have to get this, 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 and this done. And then before you know it, it's been six months and you haven't spent more than five minutes with each other. When was the last time you apologized to the world around you for spending time with God? for spending time with your very creator, when was the last time you talked to the world and said, I'm sorry, I didn't respond right away, but I was praying. But the opposite is true. We start, even my prayer this morning, we start almost every prayer that we have with God, with God, I'm, I've been so busy, I'm sorry, I haven't spent much time with you. And we expect and we know he's going to understand, but he already knows, but he's still asking why. Our lives by design and influence are influenced by the ideals and the opinions of the culture around us. And they do not leave a lot of time for purposeful, meaningful time in God's presence. There's little time for prayer and there's even less time for quiet reflection or contemplation. Many, if not most of us, 
Isaiah becomes so accustomed to this that this breakneck pace that we run our lives that when it becomes still we're uncomfortable moments free of stress of deadlines and worry and feelings of awkwardness feel wrong and when we should be praying we just wonder what it is we're forgetting and what we're forgetting is to stop remembering and just pray so quick little demonstration that um, Mary kind of already did this morning and it wasn't very much fun for me I'm going to be honest because I was coming up here today so I had a lot of things on my mind we're great at making excuses for ourselves right but if everyone can close your eyes for a second and I want everyone just to be quiet with their eyes closed for one full minute I didn't forget to count. That really was just a minute. How many of you enjoyed that? Okay, there's a well, well, Mary, that's cheating. <laughs> but being still is difficult. And it's difficult because we become conditioned to not be still. We sometimes find it difficult to see the benefits of it, even just a few moments. To be peace at peace with God and mindful in contemplation. John Wesley says in his sermon of the means of grace, outward religion is nothing worth without the religion of the heart. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. External worship is lost labor without a heart devoted to God. We can come to church, we can pray, we can give our tithings, we can do all the things that good Christians do, but all of it is worth nothing if we do not have the relationship with God in our hearts. First Peter 3, 3 and 4. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty, a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth to God's sight. Romans 12, 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Such deliberate moments of stillness, contemplation, and prayer seem overwhelming. Maybe impossible for some. We panic. Our minds wander. As soon as there's no noise to distract us. How do we fix this? How do we teach ourselves to spend that all-important time with our living God? The word, the word contemplation this morning... I, is more of a description of a behavior but it's a behavior that we see modeled in the Bible through Christ and I'm using it to describe peaceful, silent, calm prayer in the life of a believer my life, in your life Mark 1.35 we see Jesus early in the morning he, he gets up to go pray alone very early in the morning while I was while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. We don't know if he prayed out loud or quietly. We don't know if he prayed in song and worship. We don't know if he brought like a laundry list of the people he'd encountered over the week before. And so, you know, God helped Betty and Susie and Jackie. And Did he pray his favorite songs? 
But when I think about contemplation and stillness and connecting with God, I think about this verse because there is no description of it. It just says he went off to pray. And that moves me because honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't want to live a life without a powerful and purposeful prayer life. And who doesn't want the fullness that a powerful prayer life brings? Richard Foster describes prayer, when we pray, genuinely pray, the real condition of our heart is revealed. Are you praying for forgiveness? Are you praying for hope? Praying for peace? Are you praying for salvation? Release from the season? But the real condition of our hearts are revealed when we genuinely pray. That is as it should be. Because this is when God truly begins to work with us. And this is when the adventure begins. And the adventure of life begins new each day. Luke 9, 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. He doesn't say upon confession and baptism. He doesn't say pick up their cross on communal Sunday. But daily. And to pick up your cross daily, you must spend time with God in meaningful, quiet, intentional prayer to spend time in the presence of the Holy Spirit and move forward each day to fulfill God's intentions and God's will, not yours or that of the society that we live in. Take up your cross and follow me. Follow me. Follow my example. Live my life today and every day. This is the truest calling of all Christians. It's the basis of the Great Commission. But how is this possible in today's world when time for God is truly, for most of us, I believe, seen as an inconvenience? And the answer to that is prayer. Again, regarding prayer, John Wesley, John Wesley writes, First, and above all else, as a means, all who desire the grace of God are to wait for it, in the way of prayer. We must pray. We must be still. We must contemplate the will of God to discern His will from our own or from the will of the culture around us. For 18 to 20 hours a day, my mind, heart, and soul are bombarded with influences from this world. If I do nothing to counter these, to keep myself grounded in my walk with following Him, then I will become prey to the enemy. For he and all of his legions are still about seeking whom they may devour. There are 63 passages in the Bible describing the importance of prayer. I found that kind of amazing. 38 of them are specifically Jesus quoted in prayer. His baptism, Luke 3, before heading to Galilee, Mark 1. After, I'm not going to read them all. Um, Healing, Luke 5, the return of the 70 in Luke 10, praying over the children in Mark 19, asking the Father to glorify his name in John 12, on and on and on. In fact, Jesus prayed all night before choosing his disciples. All night. So here's Jesus just weeks away from announcing his identity to the world, getting ready to make probably the single most important decision in his ministry as it pertains to humans. That is, he was going to pick who would carry his teaching and his word to the world. We <laughs> would put off prayer because we'd be looking over resumes. We'd be talking to people, trying to find who was the best fit. We would run a background check, we'd check through Facebook, and we would make the best decision that we could on the information that we had and then wonder why it failed. The fact is, our best decision on the best information provided by people is still imperfect information. Should we trust our God, forego all the social norms of making a decision and lean into prayer, ask God and meditate in His Word, remain patient during the season, we would see success. But going back to the patience, it would come in God's time. Not ours. 
Prayer is our most amazing avenue for connecting with the Lord. And let's think about this for a moment. We're literally invited to converse with the creator of the universe. Why would we not want to partake of that blessing every moment we could? How is anything else in this world more important than that? That God himself, who created everything that is, was, or ever will be, wants to talk to you. If God were to come down to earth in the flesh at any moment, would you, would you finish working first? Would you ask him to hold on while you tweeted about it before you started talking to him? If you were there physically in your presence, because he is essentially physically in your presence all the time. So we have 63 passages of Concerning prayer, does anyone want to guess how many questions or how many passages there are regarding the resurrection? Speaking of Easter, the resurrection makes and confirms Jesus is God. It is his triumph over death, his proof of eternal salvation, and thereby our eternal oath of salvation. And that monumentally important part of the Bible, how many passages? Do you think there are regarding it? There's 19. Only 19 passages regarding the resurrection and 63 passages regarding prayer. I believe that this may be because that while the resurrection is, in fact, the moment of salvation for the world, it cannot be realized without prayer. And if we're not praying, if we're not doing our part, being in communion with God, then it was all for naught. So if prayer leads to conversation, that leads to contemplation, that leads to understanding and discernment, why do we not pray more? Many of you are thinking, I don't, I don't know what to say. When I pray, I, I, I sound silly. I don't know how to start. It feels weird. And... The expectation, the command, is to pray without ceasing. So if you're having trouble starting, you're thinking, that's a little overwhelming for me because I, I can't even start one. Richard Foster, again, he said, I urge you, carry on an ongoing conversation with God about the daily stuff of your life for now. Don't worry about saying the right thing. Don't worry about the the formation of the prayer. Did it start right? Did it end right? Just share your hurts, your sorrows, your dreams, your happiness. Don't forget to share your happiness with God. And just freely and openly pray. God listens in compassion and love just like we do when our children come to talk to us. He delights in our presence. I I love that. It, it, it appears quite a few times in the Bible. But just to think of God delighting in my presence. I think of when I get home and, and my son comes running down the stairs. And my daughter runs to the front door. And even the dog gets into it, right? And they're just like, ah, oh, they're all so happy that I'm home. That is an amazing feeling. God delights the same way every time I spend five minutes to talk to him. We learn by doing and... You just have to make the discernment to start somewhere. One of the ways that we can start is just by lifting up our eyes. Going back to Katie's point, when we're in that, when we're in those moments, when we feel like we are in a place where maybe it's not appropriate or, or, or that we just cannot pull ourselves away from whatever it is to pray, just lift up your eyes. Psalms 121, 1 and 2 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The principle here is that at times, each and every day, we can just stop and do nothing but look up. Look 
clean up causes us to change our perspective and focus on something other than what's in front of us. And in this case, focus on God. As you take time and stop what you're doing to look at God as a Christian, you're reminded that He cares for you and that He's watching over you. And then perhaps you can take that moment and just say hi. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your comings and goings, both now and forevermore. I don't know about you, but I find this incredibly comforting because I wouldn't want to live my life alone most of the time. And I think that just looking up is an idea that most of us can do, right? We're walking down the street, we're driving in, when we're driving in the car, I don't know how many times I look down at my phone, how hard would it be to look up for a second? At least then my peripherals, at least still on the road. So, I, I recommend, because it works for me, schedule a day and a time to stop whatever you're doing and to put away the distractions of life and sit in silent prayer. Now, I saw this as monumentally impossible because when I first tried to put the schedule in, it was this 30-minute block that just didn't fit anyway. But as we demonstrated at the beginning of the sermon this morning, one minute is a really long time when you're quiet. So take maybe five minutes and just put a reminder in your phone, write it on your calendar, your computer, however you keep track of your life, and just always take that five minutes when it's written down. Begin the habit and allow the Holy Spirit to help you perpetuate that habit from there. Stillness and quiet are incredibly powerful tools for your overall spiritual health. Especially, I think, today, because our lives are overwhelmingly busy. And they're full of expectations, and they're full of responsibility. And each life, and each moment of each life, can seem as important as the last. Psalms 46. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in earth. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. What is it about stillness and silence that helps us get reacquainted with the Lord? Why does our soul, our innermost being, feel at rest there in the quiet? Why is silence so sacred? There's a dozen more questions that I could ask on this, but uh, oddly, oddly enough, um, I went to the story of Elijah and his encounter with the Lord in book one. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is about to pass by. Then a powerful wind tore through the mountains and ripped the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? The Lord wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the earthquake. He couldn't be found in the fire. The Lord was there through all of that in a gentle whisper. A lot of us live such chaotic and busy lives that it's few and far between that we actually have the space to entertain the gentle whisper of God. But this is exactly why it's so important for us to make time for silence, prayer, and contemplation. 
We may think that all the millions of things that we have to do every day are what are most important and valuable. But stillness will usually tell you a different story. The Lord your God, the maker of heaven and earth, is with you, waiting for you to wait with him. Are you willing to be silent enough to hear the whisper of God? As we finish up today, um, let's take a moment to be brutally honest. And I'm going to ask you a question. And please honestly consider, truly consider what I'm about to ask you. Is all your striving and hustle, all the appointments and activities and actions that you have every day, all these things you do, are they making you a more peaceful person? <coughs> Karen and I have been in prayerful consideration on these questions, strangely enough, for the, the last few weeks now. And the answer for us was no. Not at all. No matter how hard we try, we push harder, we work longer, we sleep less, there's always something else around the bend. The goal is never truly reached and there's no end, less death. There's always something else to do, to fix, to help, inside the constant movement of our goal to make it to the top of this plateau where we could then rest, right? That was our goal. We're going to get up there and then we can rest. But every time we looked up, the plateau just grew. More importantly, we stopped and we're silent and we're still and talked to God and during this time, following the metaphor, we turned around and we looked at the trail behind us and we noticed our forgotten children. We noticed our distant God. And all of the things that mattered most were behind us because we were focused on everything in front of us. The life grounding faith that we're trying to achieve was being left behind in our striving to achieve it. As you think about these questions, I, I want to read one of what I believe is one of the most important and powerful passages in the New Testament. And it's not only one of the greatest reminders of our Lord's compassion and heart for us, but it also holds very special personal meaning to my life and the life of Kara. And that's Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It takes intentional effort in the culture that we live in today to carve out sacred time and space to connect with the Lord. <coughs> but when you hear the words of Christ from Matthew 11, 28, and you realize there's space for your burdens, there's space for your exhaustion, your chaos, as well as your happiness, your joy and successes, what an amazing feeling that could be to share with him. So try to set a reminder on your phone. Try to set a reminder on your calendar, computer. Maybe if you can, before it gets to be 300 degrees, carve out a weekend in the mountains, go camping, go to a hotel, go wherever it is that you enjoy, whatever you used to do that made you happy before you got too busy, do that. And while you're there, spend time with God, thanking Him for allowing you to do it. It's worth it. He's there in the stillness. But you have to be willing to listen for the gentle whisper. Let's pray together. 
Lord, we thank you for bringing us together today. It's still a joyously amazing sight for me to see people congregating again. It's, it is a beautiful thing. We were meant to be together. We were meant to be with you. And it is so nice to be having these opportunities again. Lord, I ask a special blessing over everybody that is here and everybody that is listening today that they make that first step, regardless of their circumstances, regardless of their life, regardless of the level of relationship that they currently have with you, that they take out just five minutes, just a couple times a week, to sit quietly with you and pray. And I pray for strength, I pray for desertion, and I pray for your love to be expressed through me in every word and every action of my life. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for letting me talk to you today. Let's sing just that chorus of my groom.
And then, um, like Curtis said, make a plan right now. Because if we don't, what do they say? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So make a plan on how you're going to contemplate this week. And do it. Do it. Step out of that comfort zone. Um, don't forget to... Um, if you get that email about the Easter thing, uh, Miss Sherry sends out emails on Tuesday. If you get that email, please respond if you're going to help us with Easter, April 4th. It's going to be in the park. Um, and don't forget about the couples class, the women's, um, the prayer night. We would love to see you. If you have tithes and offerings, that can be in the box in the back. And most importantly, may you know that you are loved. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week.